We are back to The Chosen Journey. It is chapter three. I'm your host, The Chosen Lawyer, and my co-host, actually he's the host, Steve Carse. I'm the co-host, The Chosen Lawyer. So we are host A, host B, and we're back with you today. And we have an exciting different topic, which Steve does not know what's going to be. So let's jump into it. Cooperstown. All right, Cooperstown. That's a, it's a great place. Love, love Cooperstown. So let's, uh, first of all, how many times have you been to Cooperstown in your life? Would you figure? Uh, I, I've been a handful of times. Um, don't know the exact number, but I, I would say roughly four or five times. Played there once in the Hall of Fame game when I was with Cleveland in, in 1999, I, was belie- I believe. And then I uh, had a couple opportunities to, uh, you know, go there when I was in the minor leagues. Uh, we traveled to Oneonta, New York to play the Yankees, and, and we weren't too far from there, so we got to visit. And then went as a few times as a kid. Okay. Have you gone back as an adult uh, to visit a, as a fan? I have not gone uh back as an adult or as a fan to go back and and see what it is like now but there'll be an opportunity here i believe uh they have a 12u tournament uh in cooperstown that uh my son might end up playing in or i just may take a family trip up to cooperstown uh when my son gets a little bit older and he understands uh you know the ramifications of of what it is and the history of the game and, and teach him a little bit more uh about that I, I so he has not seen Cooperstown yet, and I know his love of baseball. Oh boy! Okay, so if you're a baseball fan, Cooperstown. Imagine like when Christmas coming. Imagine Christmas on steroids times a thousand, and that's Cooperstown of baseball. Like it's you drive in, and it's literally baseball town, par- baseball memorabilia, paraphernalia. I remember the last time I was so I've only been twice. I went as a kid, and I went as an adult. I stayed till they closed. They, they literally kicked me out of Cooperstown. I was there for six hours and it, I still didn't finish it. it. There's so much to absorb there. It's unbelievable. There's so much in the building, uh, the history of the game and how it's built up and how it started. Um, obviously, from the gloves that they started to use and the uniforms that they had and then how that generates in, into today's game. Um, you know, it's just a beautiful place in, in general. Uh, if you get up there in, in the middle of the summer, uh, the weather's fantastic. It's a small town and uh, it, you just have the greatest time. The best. It is literally the best. Like it's the Mecca of baseball. You just feel it in the air when you're there and they do such an amazing job with it as far as what they put up and the stories. And you just feel so enriched seeing it. Um, I tried to look up as far as uh as far as for yourself on the ballot, if you ever got a Hall of Fame vote, I know it's one of those kind of things. I did not see that a Hall of Fame vote came. Sorry, my friend. I mm. maybe maybe that Veterans Committee will still come through for me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but you had a year, right, when you played with everybody that was in. Do you recall that one? Yeah, I I do. <laughs> uh, I remember getting a phone call, um, and um, the the person who was interviewing me asked me. Uh, do you know this statement? And I'm like, no, I really don't. I was coaching in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, and I was in high A ball uh, as a coach with the the Cleveland Indians. And uh, I don't remember exactly what year it was, but it was the year that uh, was Maddox and Smoltz and uh, Frank Thomas. Correct. And then the three ma- and then the three managers, uh, La Russa, uh, Cox, and Torrey. And there was only one player in the history of the game who played with all three and was managed by all three. And that player was me. <laughs> Just so happens to, uh, you know, work out like that, uh, you know, I was just very fortunate enough to play with a lot of great players and be managed by a lot of great managers. How did they not fly you in for this? Like you should have been like crowd central. Like you should be giving everybody a high five and like, Steve, thanks for the good luck charm, buddy. Yeah, no doubt. But, uh, you know, just to hear that, cause I would have never have known, uh, that, 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 that was the case. I did know you I find out before time. or after the actual hall of fame, uh, ceremony? Oh, I found out, but I found out before because obviously all the sports writers do all their homework on yeah. all these little, uh, increases of, who played with who and who's going in and yeah. what can we come up with? Uh, 
Um, so uh, that was just kind of one of the things that, that popped up and uh, it, it was kind of crazy, but uh, it, it's a fun little, little thing to be attached to. Did you debate about going at all at that point? I did not. Um, no, eh? You know, no, uh, you know, I'm one of those guys. I, I don't like usually big crowds. Yeah. I, I would rather be one that kind of steps back and stays out of the spotlight. Uh, and it's, it's just one who, you know, loves to, to watch, but not be involved in, in a lot of things. It's funny, you know, because I would have thought, and I heard it, and I, I didn't read too deep into it. I thought he must have attended. And then I thought to myself, now as you're saying that, Right. The guy with no social media handle, the guy who's anonymous, who now we're breaking him out of it, uh, out of the shell. And uh, you're going to be all over the net, buddy. Sorry to break it to you. But no, I, yeah. I do get I do get what, where you're coming from with it, for sure. And um, it, I guess it's one of those things that I, it's funny because I think like co-workers and if somebody gets a big honor. It's nice to attend their banquet ceremony and everything else. I'm sure if it was like, for example, like your lifelong catcher or something like that, and he reached out and said, hey, Steve, I'd be yeah. mean a lot to me. Then maybe it'd be a different circumstance, right? No doubt, hundred percent. Like, if there's somebody that's going into the Hall of Fame and and they reach out and would want me to attend, uh, of course, uh, that's just the the respect that you have for the, the guys that you've played with and the achievements that they've that they've made. So, uh, in in that instance, of course, that that would make complete sense. But uh, you know, in in other words, I just like to step back, you know, watch the great players, uh, you know get put into one of the major institutions of, of baseball. And that's what everybody works hard for. You don't, you know, you work hard to get to the big leagues, you work hard to have success, but uh, you know, you put in the work and then you're, you're given that honor by the people who, you know, are, are able to put you in when that time comes. Uh, it must be an amazing feeling and, and, and all those guys are worthy of it. And uh you know, it's just a, it's a great group of guys that, uh, uh, achieve that goal. Did, uh, at any point in your career, did you ever speak to Ricky Henderson after your trade? Did you ever bump into him on the field? Do you guys ever discuss the trade? Uh, yeah, briefly. I mean, I played with him in 94. Oh, that's right. You guys did play one for, <laughs> so, for, for a brief, well, I think Toronto. Ricky's still, I think Ricky's still going, actually, I'm joking. But. Yeah, no doubt. He might he could probably still play for him today. But he, anyway, was, he was so coaching he, for a point. I remember he was the first base coach, I think, for the Mets at one point, if I'm not mistaken. I think he was I, done the I coaching. Don't remember, I don't remember I'm that, pretty sure. I do remember that after he won the World Series in 1993, yes. he came back and signed as a free agent with Oakland. So I had the opportunity to play with him and talk to him a little bit about, uh, you know, what had transpired. I mean, um, it's, it's, it's just one of those things again, that, you know, is an honor to be attached to. I get traded for a hall of famer yeah. and, uh, you know, then got to play with them the, the next year. I think personality wise, you cannot find two different people than Ricky Henderson and Steve Carse. I imagine like, it's like a joke. Ricky Henderson and Steve Carse go into a bar, you know? Uh, so I guess he's Ricky's not- a beauty. He really is. I mean, what a tremendous player, uh, you know, and, he might be the fastest guy I've ever seen get dressed in my life. Oh, get dressed. Oh yeah. 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 He would walk in like five minutes before stretch and he'd probably beat me out on the field. Wow. It was crazy. It was like Superman going into a phone booth and coming out. Clark Kent going into, into a phone booth and coming out as Superman. It was crazy. Everybody's got the folklore Ricky Henderson story. Did you ever hear the Ricky Henderson story with John Allward? I've heard plenty of Ricky stories that we could go on for days. I wish I knew how many of them were authentic. But when, when John Allward was on the on the field at the time with the batting helmet and Ricky's looking at him and goes, you know, that's that's weird. You know, I remember playing once with a fa- first baseman that also wore the helmet on the field. That's uh, uh, that's kind of funny seeing you do it. And goes, uh, Ricky, that was me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you never but, uh, know. So but he did not invite you to his ceremony, I take it, then when he got into Cooperstown. Uh, no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> I only uh, played with him for a short time. So fair, fair. That being said, uh, I think I know the answer to this one as well, but I have, if we're going to cover the journey properly and we have to cover all this base now, everybody's interconnected. Uh, is there any Steve Carse memorabilia sitting in Cooperstown? That is a great question. I don't have that answer. Uh, I can probably say there is some memorabilia that's attached to something I did that's in Cooperstown, yes. but I don't know if it's technically any of my stuff that's in Cooperstown. 
because uh, one game I was thinking it always comes back to that 9-11 game and if they if anybody took memorability do you recall from that game if anybody had asked for any of your pieces of uh, equipment after that uh they probably wouldn't ask me they probably just go in my locker and take it and re <laughs> replace the hat or something but no but what would be attached would be the Mike Pia Mike Piazza's bat or Mike Piazza's uniform or I don't even know what happened to the ball that left the stadium, to be quite honest with you, if they retrieved it and put it in Cooperstown or if somebody still has it uh, on their mantle in, in New York City. It could be one of the offices there. You know, you never know where, where, where these memorabilia things end up. You're right. It, I've always I've always thought when you, when you bring it up and you have such a good attitude about it, because at the end of the day, it was such an important thing for the city and you carry it with a fond memory. It's like if you walk into a bar or let's say uh, a restaurant, and Mitch Williams is sitting there and you guys discuss giving up uh, monumental home runs. I I'm pretty sure he won't have the same attitude that you do. Maybe he does at this point now, but uh, back then that's yeah. a doozy, right? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, those, 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 those stick with you for a long time. Like I will never forget that as long as I live, that will be etched in my memory. And I will remember every single piece of what, transpired during that game and and while i was on the mounds feeling the emotions and i'm sure mitch is the same way you know mm -hmm. he probably feels the same thing um you know I, I don't know if he wants to forget it or not but it is what it is right i mean he's competing his tail off and you know he's trying to get joe carter out he's not trying to give up a home run it's just it's one of those things in the universe that just happened and uh, that's why we play the game we play the game to compete and let the chips fall where they may. Sometimes they work in your favor and, and, and sometimes they, they don't. But I will, hold on, before we move on, yes. I will say something. Okay. In my interview with David Stearns, since we went from the last segment uh, to, to this episode here, yes. David Stearns, when I did my interview in 2018 with the Brewers and I, and I chatted with them, reminded me he was at that game at 9-11. And he was a junior in high school when I gave up that home run. <laughs> I thought that was very cool of him to be able to bring that up and, and understand what that game meant and, and then how that transpired to get him to stay in baseball and want to be part of baseball after being in that moment. It's special. It, it's one of those things that especially for millennials and, and, and the younger generation, unless you actually were around that era and as far as what was happening in the world at the time and the, and the feeling like that was a, to have that game played and how it uplifted people and, you know, a city and a country and a world, it was, you can't even measure that. It was just uh, that, that, that game was very instrumental to positivity and to new beginnings. But you're just talking about it and I'm getting chills all over my arms. I mean, again, like if you go back and you watch that clip. Yes. As a millennial or as a youth to understand maybe what that meant. You will have chills. You if you understand, you know, how that transpired from 9-11 to when the game was played 10 days later at Shea Stadium, the first game back in New York City and you watch that clip and you watch as the camera is panning around to the fans in the stands and people crying and people hugging uh, and, and just giving them a, a free moment to take their minds away from what they had to endure during those past 10 days when, when they got attacked in New York City. Uh, you know, I, I just, I, I can't imagine not anybody having, uh, a, an emotional feeling when they watch in that, but, you know, it's, um, uh, and I, I love the way you're expressing it. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's great again, that there can be, you know, from the negativity of giving a home run, but really it brought so much positivity overall. And you can look back on it fondly, you know, walking through Cooperstown, there's not a lot of relievers, especially closers that are in Cooperstown, right? And even the best ones, like, I, you know, think of Mariona Rivera, you know, uh, some would say the best of all time, if not very darn close, right? 
And guess what? The guy was not perfect. I remember his meltdown against the Red Sox, right? Yeah, yeah it happens. It happens. It happens. My, I was going to ask you, did you see the movie uh, For the Love of the Game with Kevin Costner? I did. Okay. Do you remember when he's zoning in? So when he goes out to the mound and how he's able to zoop, zone out, everybody doesn't hear anybody, just mm-hmm. sees the catcher. How realistic is that? Is that what it's like to be on the mound as a professional, at least for you? Sometimes. I mean, uh, it varies. You know, yeah. sometimes, you know, when guys talk about whether you're basketball or baseball or any other sport, football, when they talk about being in the zone, you know, when Stephen Curry is in the zone and he's dropping threes, it doesn't matter where he's at and how he's shooting. He's just feeling it at that time. And I can promise you, he, he would probably tell you that the game is so slow and he just understands that I see the basket and it just looks bigger than what it is. And he's making that. It's the same thing in baseball when you're throwing the ball and you feel really good um, and you feel like you can command the ball and put the ball wherever you want, or your curveball is really good or a hitter when he's hitting and has 10 straight hits in a row, which doesn't happen very often, but is putting good swings on the ball. Uh, everything is just slower to you. Everything just seems a little bit bigger to you and you just are in the zone, so to speak, uh, at that particular time. And then I can tell you there are days where you go out there and you can't throw a strike and you hear everything. Like you hear a cricket or you hear a person in the front row talking to you and it's clear as day, like they're standing right next to you on the mound. You just hear these things. So it, it's both sides of the spectrum. I mean, there, there are days, there are weeks, there are months that, go th- that you go through that you're in either the zone or you're trying to figure out how to get back to where that, what that feeling is. That's where I think, uh, you know, talking about it as a chosen journey, anybody watching this in any line of work or in life, baseball is a metaphor for life, really. I think to uh, field players, when they get the yips and then the catcher can't throw back to the pitcher, when the second baseman can't throw to the first baseman, they just, they, all of a sudden they just develop this mental block. Yes. And then, and when it comes to relievers, it always blew my mind how one bad pitch, one bad game, and some people, and even at a young age, are never the same. They can't get past that. They replay that moment in their minds over and over and over, and they can't leave it and start off afresh. And it seems like they're trying to get two outs for every one out to try to make up for that one home run, and it becomes like this vicious cycle. The one thing I've always noticed with the true pros and the Hall of Famers that game is done. That game is left. It's over and they've let it go and they moved on as a professional, Steve, having good games, bad games. How were we able, you know, when, when things didn't go your way, how were you able to mentally let that go and be strong the next time out? Yeah. So with, with a lot of help, uh, I had a lot of veteran older players um, talk to me about situations and you live and you learn right you get to the big leagues and you know you try to lean on some of the older players who have more experience and that's where experience comes in because they've gone through it uh it's just as a parent you try to teach your kids because you've gone through it and until they go through it they don't really know until they know uh but i had a rule uh once i learned from some of the older guys and my rule was that particular day is over and done with at midnight. I can think about it up until midnight. When the clock strikes midnight, right after that, that day is over, it's washed, it's in the past, we can't change it, move on to the next day, and the next day is a new day. Um, Baseball's a game of failure. And for young kids and people out there, uh, they need to understand that. If you make seven outs out of 10 times at bat and you hit 300, you're a really good hitter almost to the point where you might win a silver slugger, you know? And so, you fail the majority of the time. And you fail the majority of the time. So it's about consistency. It's about being better the majority of time than when you're not. You're going to make mistakes. You're not going to have great days. There are going to be days where your body doesn't feel good. There's going to be days you give up runs and, and lose the game. It's the guys who can get past that as fast as they can who are going to have more success as the season goes along. Again, as a reliever, you may pitch in 70 to 75 games. I don't know one reliever that's had a zero ERA through a whole season like that. So, you know, it's, it's going to be one of those things where, you know, failure is a part of the sport. You have to get over that as quick as possible. 
but you've got to be more consistent in succeeding than failing in anything in life. One guy that comes to mind and he just announced his retirement was Jake Arrieta. And when he had that one dominant, you know, second half, yes. I have never seen anything like that in my life. Like he was literally untouchable for half a season and uh, good on him that he figured out when he did. And don't know if we'll ever see another pitching performance like that, but you know what? We got, we got lots of time, right? Uh, that's called being in the zone. That's called being in the zone folks. Now, uh, because, you know, I know you've started and you've relieved in your life. And as we're wrapping up, I'm going to bring this up because it's, uh, from the, from the, it's funny because especially if you're playing fantasy baseball or you love watching for your team, it can be it can be a very consistent closer or it can be a revolving door on closers. And so I wanted to bring up for fun now, as of Tuesday, who our saves leaders are right now. And when we go to the end of the season, see how close we come to it. And you'll find it very interesting, I think, because you'll know one of them on the list, obviously. Yes. So as of Tuesday, I did not inc include last night's games. So leading the majors uh, as of that day uh, with six saves was Jordan Romano with the Toronto Blue Jays. So that's pretty impressive. And uh, again, one of those guys that I don't know if we thought he was going to be a closer or he's going to be a starter and where he's going to head. But uh, obviously it took to him pretty quick. It's, one of, it's funny because sometimes you just throw something in a roll, see where it catches, you catch lightning in a bottle and guys just kind of run with it, right? And the question will be, will we see him on the leaderboard come the end of the year? This will be, a, I think goes along with number two, Taylor Rogers of the uh, Padres with five. Then we got three guys that are tied with four saves. Josh Hader, which health permitting, I'm sure we're going to see him in the top five finish the year. Liam Hendricks of the White Sox. And David Robertson is back with yes. the Cubs. I remember Robertson when he was on the Yanks. And man, mm -hmm. untouchable as they come. And, you know, people get injured, right? Things change, roles change. And then all of a sudden, you know what? We have a team where we have a lot of youngsters. Maybe we'll throw the veteran there, see where it goes, right? Such a diverse bunch of players up there on that leaderboard. And that's, I think, what we find generally as far as in the closing game, what generally happens, right? Yeah, it, it, it's, it varies from year to year. But saves are indicative on how good or bad your team is. Uh, if you play a lot of close games and you're a closer, you're going to get a lot of saves. If you play a game where your offense is, you know, uh, really good and you play a lot of games that are four or five runs, you're not going to get a lot of saves. So how I look at it is, OK, at the end of the year, you take the top five closers in all of Major League Baseball. And then you go through their stats and you find out how many of those guys in the top five saved the game went up three runs, went up two runs, or went up one run? And that will give you an indication, in my opinion, of how each closer represents himself. I mean, if I have 35 saves in a season and I have a three-run lead in 27 of those, and I have 27 out of my 35 saves that are by three runs, it's a lot easier to save a game when you're up three runs entering the game than when you're up one run entering the game. So all the teams who have these two to one, five to four, and you're only up one run or you come in with runners on base and, and shut it down, uh, in my opinion, should be worth more than ones that are three run saves. I think, I think a saving grace point was the invention or at least the mainstream use of the hold so that people, you know, that are pitching in leverage situations and are bridging the gap that they get a credit for the work that they did, because 10, 15 years ago, that was not a, that was not a thing. I agree 100 percent. It's a it's a good indicator of, of of guys that pitch at the back end in high leverage situations. Uh, you know, we can maybe get into this a, a little bit more. Uh, and it's fun to talk about and, and make people understand a little bit more of. Of, of how important those guys at the back end of the bullpen are. Because a guy who comes in the eighth inning, uh, again, when you're winning, say, two to one, and he faces the middle of the lineup, three, four, five, and he gets out of that, and he takes it to the ninth inning, and it's still two to one. Then your team comes up in the top of the ninth, and they score two runs. Now you're up four to one, and that closer comes into the bottom of the ninth and closes out the game. For me, the game was really saved from the eighth inning guy 
because he faced the middle of the lineup and kept the game two to one and gave the closer the opportunity. And the, and the closer was fortunate enough that his team hit a two run homer to put him up by three runs and still gets credited for the save. Yeah. I've seen that in the sixth innings, seventh innings that literally, like you're saying that situation bases loaded, you got, and, 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 and you're only up by one. That is the most difficult situation where there's nobody on and there's, and you're up by three. Right. But yeah, no, I, like, so how, how I've talked about it with people or got into it is in my opinion, the transition from what a save is or a hold, there should be a point system uh, on leverage. And maybe you get five points for uh, a hold that has a one run lead. You get three points for a hold that's a two run lead and you get one point for a hold that's a one run, a, a three run lead. And then by the end of the year, you know during the point system how high of a leverage that that player pitched in and can give him credit or, you know, less credit to, you know, the, the role that he played. And that's more for arbitration and how they're going to pay guys, in my opinion, because some guys get a raw deal uh, that pitch in the eighth inning and are always coming in and one run games and do an incredible job. But then at the end of the year, there's no saves in their column. It's all holds. And then the team doesn't have to pay that player because he's not credited with a save. He's only credited with a hold. We may have people in the commissioner's office listening to this as we speak, and they're going to say, well, Mr. Steve Carsey, maybe you need to come down uh, to our head offices and uh, help us revolutionize the game. So uh, you never know, buddy, where you're going to head. You got some interesting ideas. The first time I ever heard the point system, and uh, I'm intrigued. Yeah, I mean, it, it would go across the board for all relievers. Uh, you know, I, I think that's just something that uh, makes it a little bit fair for the players. Uh, again, how many guys in the, in the Hall of Fame uh, would you see that would be in there if they had 300 holds as opposed to 300 saves? Fair enough, but you know what? Maybe someday. Maybe someday. Maybe I mean, someday. The, the game is always evolving, and yeah. there's always new rules um, that are being put into place. And uh, you know, these are just things that and topics that come up that are always fun to talk about and, yeah. and be able to throw around. And they will continue to. And that's one of the things I, I will uh, I will end here. For us on this chapter but to encourage the fans again to send in your questions for steve carsey and it could be on steve's career it could be on the current state of baseball ideas you have we love talking anything and everything baseball so you got your topic send it in and you never know you may be the next one uh appearing on our show absolutely please send them in we would love to uh get into depth and and talk about some of the things that uh all of you want to talk about steve as always a pleasure my friend thank you for hosting this documentary series with me and uh, we'll see you back very soon for chapter four. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Keep living the journey in the meantime, my brother. That's all right. Thanks.